Welcome to a special Easter edition of Study Through the Bible, where we uh, study the Bible in community, and we usually do that through daily assignments, which this last week you've been looking through passages of scripture related to the resurrection, and we're going to be handling today questions in the scripture about the resurrection, and maybe questions that you've had about our resurrection or the resurrection of Jesus. And so uh, we have those daily assignments. Then we have these weekly videos where I share my insights into the passage we've been studying. And if you have insights or questions that I didn't cover, put them in the comments down below and I'll be checking back to see what y'all have to say. If all of that sounds good, click that subscribe button, join the community, tell your friends, and let's go ahead and get into this today. So the first question is comes from Matthew 22, 23. It was a question asked by the Sadducees of Jesus. And they asked, likewise, the second, okay. They asked, the same day the Sadducees came to him, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh, and last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And so here's the question that was posed to Jesus. This was posed by Sadducees, and we're told that they don't believe in the resurrection. And so they come to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, you believe in a resurrection. You teach a resurrection. In fact, you say you're going to resurrect from the dead. Well, we have a question for you. There's a, in the Law of Moses, there was this um, example or this, this law in which Moses said that if a man in Israel dies and he hasn't had a, a male heir to pass on his, his inheritance to, then his next of kin, and we're going to be getting into the book of Ruth soon, and this is going to be very applicable, but his next of kin is supposed to raise up seed, so have children in the name of that deceased brother, okay? And uh, then that was the way that the inheritance was going to continue to pass on down the family line. Well, that's all well and good, but you believe in a resurrection. So there's this uh, guy we know, and he was married to seven different women, and none of them produced seed. And so whose wife in the resurrection is she going to be? And Jesus' answer, and this is corollary to our question, what is the role of relationships in heaven? Hey Elijah, I'm recording my message, so I need to go, okay? Okay, so this is corollary to our question in which we ask, what is the role of relationships in heaven? Are we going to have the same kind of relationships? Um, are we going to know each other in heaven? Are we going to still be married in heaven? Are we still going to be parent, child kind of questions in heaven? And there are certain groups, and some who even call themselves Christian, who believe that certain things like families are forever. Marriage is eternal as long as you get married in certain settings or get it officiated over by a certain person. And that's actually not true. In fact, it goes flat out against the answer that Jesus gave the Sadducees. His answer to their question having to do with whose wife is she going to be is to say, your question is wrong 
in the in the assumption that if there's a resurrection that we're going to be married in heaven or we're going to be married we're going to have kids and all of that kind of stuff and he says you don't err you in the resurrection they are not given in marriage they're not married they're like the angels of god in heaven and some have taken this so far as to believe that this means that you know there's no relationships in heaven or anything like that and that's not exactly what jesus is saying but what he is saying is something that's amplified later by the Apostle Paul when he says that we shall be known, even we shall know even as we are known. And in that phrase, what he is saying is when we get to heaven, we're not only going to have infinite knowledge, and but we're also going to we're also going to be completely perfect in our relationships. You see, on this earth, there's only so much because of sin. So many people that we can really be ourselves with, really be intimate with. And the marriage relationship is the most intimate relationship that we have. And the, the, probably the most pure relationship in terms of just being able to love somebody is when you were, are their parent. And when you've given birth to somebody, you've actually taken part in, you know, creating life in that way. That's probably one of the purest relationships that you have. And then we have friends, we have acquaintances, we have, you know, co-workers, we have all of these different things. And I've talked in the past how I believe every single one of those relationships on earth is to give us a glimpse of our relationship that we have with God. You see, he's our heavenly father. And so we have parent-child relationships. He, uh, Jesus said, you are my friends because I share with you what I'm doing. And so we have friendship relationships. We're told that, that Jesus is a metaphor and, um, of the, our husband as the church, that we are the bride of Christ. And so we have husband-wife relationships that we are co-laborers together, that we're joint heirs with him. All of these are very unique relationships that it talks about in Scripture. And so when we see and our, our earthly interactions, in a way, it points to a glimpse, another aspect of who God is and his relationship with us and our relationship with him. And when we go to heaven, we're in the presence of God, and we have we are one with Him. We are also at the same time going to become one with each other. And the barrier to all of our relationships here on earth, that sin, it's gone. And in a sense, I can't even imagine what existence would be like without sin, without selfishness without greed, without one-upping one, one another, where you truly love as you are loved, you know as you are known. That's the kind of relationships that we're going to have in heaven. Now, does that mean that we're not going to know that person that we were married to? Of course not. It says that we will know even as we are known. But the question is, not will our relationships that we have now be less? They will be infinitely greater the moment that we step into heaven, than they will ever be here on this earth. And so it's an upgrade of our relationships, not a diminishing. The next question we have comes from the book of Acts. And it's when Paul was standing for, before King Agrippa, and he's given in his defense of basically he's being arrested for believing in the resurrection of the dead and the resurrection of Jesus, more specifically, and preaching that message. And so it says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before you touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews especially because I know you to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, which is why I ask you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, 
if they would testify that after the most strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and I am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God, day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? And so this was a question asked by Paul, who is a believer, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he's asking it to an unbelieving Jewish king. And so he's asking him this question, King Agrippa, I'm here before you because I believe what God, all of our ancestors all along believed, that God had promised that there would be a resurrection of the dead. And so he's saying this as a Pharisee. The Pharisees did believe the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. And so he asked him a very pointed question. Why should it be an incredible thing that God should raise the dead? And so many object to the resurrection of Jesus just simply because it is a supernatural thing. By definition, everybody dies and they stay dead. That's just basically the way that things are supposed to work. But that's only if you come at it from a naturalistic point of view. If you believe in a supernatural creator of all things who has always existed, always been God, and he's all-powerful, don't you think that he would be able to rise somebody who was dead back to life. He's the one who created life. So why would he not be able to resurrect somebody from the dead? And so if you're looking at the resurrection of Jesus from the standpoint of a naturalistic expectation, saying that just doesn't happen, people don't rise from the dead, then Paul's question back to you is, your problem isn't necessarily with the resurrection. Your problem is with the existence of a God in the first place. Because if you believed in an all-powerful God who was the creator of all things, who created life in the first place, you wouldn't have any problem believing that he could rise somebody from the dead. And if he, in fact, was that one who came, became human and he lived amongst us and he died for our sins, do you not believe that he would be able to resurrect from the dead? And if Jesus rose from the dead, and we have a creator who's, who gave life and he created all things, then don't you believe that he has the ability and the power to resurrect us from the dead? Why should it be an incredible thing that God should raise the dead? Now, the next one comes from 1 Corinthians 15 and from the Apostle Paul again. And several of our questions today are going to come from this one chapter in Scripture. It is called by many the resurrection chapter. There were questions in the church in Corinth in the first century that they were asking about the resurrection. In fact, there were some in the church who were teaching that there is no resurrection from the dead. And therefore, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And Paul is correcting this false teaching, and he's answering the questions that they had about this concept of the resurrection in the meantime. And he, here's what he says. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. And yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So his question that he throws out there, if Christ is risen from the dead, then how can there be some of you that say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So 
the teaching was that they believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but that there is no actual resurrection of us from the dead. That this life is pretty much all there is, and that's all there is to it. And Paul brings them back to the gospel. This gospel is that Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead on the third day. And that's a physical, bodily resurrection, and there's absolutely no way of getting around that. And so Paul says, hey, let's go through the implications of this. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus was not risen from the dead. You can't teach that. That's contradictory. If you, there's absolutely no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus was not raised from the dead. Now, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, here's some pretty drastic implications of this. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then you are still in your sins. That means this is, this is a non-negotiable, you can't call yourself a Christian kind of thing. If you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, physically and bodily, then you cannot call yourself a Christian. This is what it means to be a Christian, to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And because of that, we are going to be risen from the dead. He has seated us in heavenly places. So if Jesus isn't risen, you're still in your sins. And your faith is in vain. You know, all of this trusting in God, all of this trusting in the Bible, all of this, you know, hope of something that's coming that's better, you know, just the ability to overcome circumstances in this life and to transcend them because we have hope of something that's going to come. That's all not true if Jesus isn't risen from the dead. And so... He, he goes, and he says, also, all, everybody who's fallen asleep in Christ is perished. And so, all of the people who trusted in Christ, and they believe that, you know, in the midst of this persecution, that this is going to, you know, this is what we're looking forward to. This is how we can count it all joy, and we can be rejoicing and count it ourselves worthy of these things. If, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then... This life is all there is. And if this life isn't going that good, then guess what? That's not a good thing. And he goes on to say, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Paul and his crew, his church planning crew, and the early church, they were undergoing severe persecution from the Jews and then later from the Romans. And he says, look, our life is a life of sacrifice. It's a life of sacrifice because of our faith in Jesus and him dying for our sins and rising again from the dead. And we are suffering from it. We're getting beaten because of it. I've suffered shipwreck. I've been in prison because of it. If Jesus hasn't risen from the dead and this isn't true, then why? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? We are of all men most pitied and miserable. And he goes on to say, if that's the case, then rather, why not eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. <coughs> so the next question, and comes in 1 Corinthians 15 as well, Paul, and this is a very, very misunderstood question, and so stay with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 29, Paul says, Or else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead don't rise at all, why are they that then the baptized for the dead? Now, just so you know, nobody really knows what in the world Paul was actually referring to historically. But here's what I can say. And all of you probably know group, there are groups that call themselves Christian who practice what they refer to as baptism for the dead. And they point to this verse as the justification saying that the early church practiced it. And this is something that's part of the true gospel. It's God's plan to you know, give a chance to all those people who died before Jesus or died without hearing the gospel, a chance to hear that message, a chance to go to heaven, a chance to transcend all that stuff. And 
while that sentiment is good and we all have that question, you know, what about the people who haven't heard? What about the people who died before Jesus? There are biblical answers to those questions. But I want to address this. What was Paul saying in this? And, and was he saying that the early church practiced this thing called baptism for the dead? And my answer is no. No, he is not saying that. And the reason why I can say that with confidence is one simple thing. Pronouns. And if you follow the pronouns in 1 Corinthians 15, it's a whole lot list of series of I, we statements, and then you statements. You know, why do we do this? Why do you say this? And then, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he goes third person in which he's talking about some other group, and then he switches right back to the first person and the second person. And so this is what he says. Else, or else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead don't rise at all? What he's doing is he's pointing to a completely outside group that the Corinthian church and believers were, were familiar with, and he's saying, look, even pagans believe this stuff. Even people that we don't agree with, they believe that there is a resurrection of the dead. You know, and I think the reason why he's hitting this is because they were approaching it from the standpoint, just like I was talking about, like that naturalistic worldview that says, you know, you can't have people rising from the dead. That's supernatural. That doesn't happen. That's miraculous. That doesn't happen. And so people don't rise from the dead. So there can't be a resurrection. And he's saying, look, that's not the way that the world functions. That's not even what the people who believe different things from us believe. And the, the, their, their lifestyle is consistent with believing that this isn't all there is. Even they look at this life and they go, look, if this is all there is, then why don't we all just go for it? And truly, if you want to be consistent, the naturalistic worldview, that's exactly where it leads you. It leads you to just selfishness. This pure, like, in it for yourself, go all in, do what's best for you, and live it up. Because this is all that there is. And when this is over, it's final and there's what they love about that is that there is no accountability at the end. And Paul says, look, we're not the only ones who believe that there's a resurrection. What, what about those guys over there who are being baptized on behalf of dead people? What about them? And so then he reels her right back in. And this is the only time that this term is ever used in scripture, which we've talked about so many times. You should never, never, never base a theological truth off of one verse. But, you know, there's guys like Joseph Smith out there who mastered, he excelled at that very thing. And there's about four or five heretical teachings of Mormonism just in 1 Corinthians 15 that he based those off of. We're going to hit one of them coming up real soon here. So, is there a baptism of the dead? Should we be doing it now? No, 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 no. But Paul says, look, those guys are doing that. That's evidence they believe it's a resurrection. That's kind of a case that generally this is an accepted worldview, not just a Christian, Judeo, you know, Christian thing. So, 1 Corinthians 15.30 and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? See, he goes right back to the we. He, he went to the we, you, and then he went they, and then he comes back to we. Okay, why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I die daily. And so he's saying, you know, why... Would we do anything else? This is what I was talking about. The naturalistic worldview leads you solely towards a survival of the fittest mentality. Why in the world would you sacrifice something 
for the benefit of another. And this is what is called the moral argument for the existence of God. That the moral argument basically says that every single one of us has an intrinsic sense of right and wrong. And in fact, I say all the time to the kids in our children's ministry, there's three words your parents never had to tell, teach you, but you knew intrinsically and you just started saying them. And those words are, that's not fair. We all have this sense of something called justice. We all have this sense of something called truth. We all have something of the sense of right and wrong. We have these abstract concepts like love and loyalty and um, mercy or whatever it is. We have these concepts. Where in the world did they come from? And how do you arrive at those kind of things from a naturalistic worldview? If we're all here by accident and there's no real purpose to our life and we are just a kind of random chance coming together of neurons in our brain that are formed by just random chance, how can you even trust that your thought, your feeling, your anything, your experience is what is real? That it is true. That it is something you should base your decisions off of. You have no real idea that that would be the case. And Paul says, look, we're facing wild beast. We're getting thrown to gladiators. We're going in prison. We're getting beaten. We're, we are, our lives are in jeopardy every single hour of every single day that we continue preaching this message that Jesus rose from the dead. Why would we stand in jeopardy? To take this a little bit further, some have said that one of the greatest arguments for the resurrection of the dead, that of resurrection of Jesus Christ, is why would anybody die for a lie? And that's exactly pretty much what Paul is asking here. You know that 11 of the 12, well, 10 of the, the 12 original apostles of Jesus Christ, they died a martyr's death. One was Judas, and he kind of took care of things himself after he betrayed Jesus, and he regretted it. Then there's 10 of the 11 that were left that died a martyr's death. They died by things like crucifixion and bow and arrows and, you know, being burned at the stake and all of those types of things because they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one who didn't die as a martyr, the, the legend has it, and we don't know exactly how true this is, but the legend has it in church history that the apostle John, that they tried to boil him in tar and he would not die. And so they exiled him to Patmos, which is where he wrote the book of Revelation. So why? You have to ask yourself, if you knew, and when it comes to the resurrection, people say that the disciples stole the body, they hid it somewhere, and then they went out into the streets and preaching that Jesus rose from the dead. And they based all of their trust in eternal life, and they risked their lives, and then they ultimately died for that hoax that they played. Ask yourself, if you knew, knew, you absolutely knew 100% that something was not true, would you die? Would you go to your grave and under the threat of persecuting, like knowing that we, if you don't recant this, then you are going to die. Would you die for a lie? So the next question, again, comes from 1 Corinthians 15. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what does it advantage me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And so Paul says, look, what advantage is it? What advantage is it that you believe that Jesus is risen from the dead if in fact he's not risen from the dead? Now, this is kind of going like, why would we put up 
with, you know, the persecution. But this is another question that you may have asked. What advantage is it to believe that Jesus rose from the dead? And I think if you throw everything that he said in reverse, you find the answer for that. And he says that if Jesus is not risen, then you are still in your sins. Which means that if Jesus is risen, that there is a forgiveness of sins and eternal life that is available to you as a free gift of his grace. And so if you are in a position where you have never trusted Jesus, and maybe you're from another religion, maybe you've just you're from a legalistic branch of Christianity, and you've never been told this, let me tell you this, that you can know that you have eternal life. You can know that your sins are forgiven. Completely washed away, wiped away by the blood of Jesus. As far as the east is from the west, which is never ending. You can know that. And then second, he says that if, there, if Jesus isn't risen, then we have no hope. We have no hope. You turn it around, if Jesus is risen from the dead, then you have hope. When things in your circumstances, in your life, in your marriage, in your finances, in your, in your kids, and whatever it is, when, it, when those things aren't working out and they're not going right, you can have hope. And hope that doesn't disappoint. Not as the world offers. You can have hope. He says, if Jesus isn't risen, that we should be pitied more than all men. If Jesus is risen, then we are not to be pitied. We have more. The Bible says that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. That the scriptures have been given to us to thoroughly equip us for every good work. He's not held anything back. He's thrown it all at us and he says, I'm all in. I'm all in. I sent my son. He died for your sins. He rose again from the dead. I, it's all finished. It's all accomplished. I've given it all. And it's all in. We're all in. That's on a personal level, on a societal level. Let me ask you this. How many schools, hospitals, humanitarian, uh, charity organizations have been founded in the name of Jesus Christ? They have done studies and they have shown that Western civilization itself was basically founded on the ideas that God, there is a creator, and that he's given us, he's created us all equal, and we all have the, the right to be able to pursue happiness. Okay, that's in our, that sounds a little bit familiar, right? Um most of this stuff, even science, and most of the, many of the disciplines of science, they were founded by people who wanted to discover the, the, the universe that God had created. Most of the things that we benefit from in our society today, we may not acknowledge it, we may not believe it, but they are the direct result of this one man, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life. He died an unjust death as a payment for your sins, and he rose again from the dead on the third day. And he offers you the world, and I, I suggest you take it. So what advantage is it? All, every advantage in the world. Next question, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? You fool. That which you sow is not made alive except to die. And that which you sow, you sow not. That body shall be but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. 
but God gives it a body as it has pleased him. And to every seed his own body, all flesh is not the same flesh. So he's saying, people argue this, what body will it come in the resurrection? Now, this is one of the most practical questions. This is like kind of like assuming there is a resurrection. Okay, like, well, what's it going to be like? What kind of body am I going to have? This is where we get down to some practical stuff. Maybe you've asked the same thing. And I have to say that throughout church history and before we had certain knowledge and certain technology out there, <coughs> people believed a lot of silly things. And they used to ask questions like, well, what happened to the missionary who gets eaten by a shark and then he that shark gets eaten by a whale and then, you know, they all just, you know, die and gets, you know, digested into the ground. You know, how is God going to raise up that guy? <laughs> Things like that. Most of the reason why Christians have traditionally believed in you know, burying their, their beloved people, loved ones in the ground in a, a casket is based off of the idea that God is going to physically resurrect that same body out of the ground. Okay, and so it creates all of these things. You shouldn't get cremated. And, you know, what about these people who die and we don't know where the body is and we weren't able to give them a proper burial and all that kind of stuff. So, what is Paul's answer to this question? And he, he says, starts out, you fool. Kind of harsh, you know. But he's saying, like, look, look, break this down to common sense. That which you sow is not made alive except to die. So he says, you take a seed, and it can be any kind of seed. You know, you have seed of one kind, seed of another kind. You know, you throw it in the ground and... Jesus alluded to this too. It, it goes into the ground alone, but if it dies, then it bears fruit, much fruit. And Paul says you sow it into the ground, that seed has to die. It has to be buried. And then that seed is made alive. But when it comes alive, it doesn't come with it. It doesn't like you don't grow seeds. It grows into a plant. And even if you were to dig under the ground once it's happened, like the seed isn't even there anymore. It's grown into something different. So let's go on. It's not the same flesh. But there's one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beast, another of fishes, another of birds. So he's going to go into a number of different examples here to help us to understand this one point that you look at and you just, I'm going over biology, you know, and animals with my, my son in, in school. And we're talking about the different features of, you know, mammals versus birds versus reptiles versus amphibians. And so he says there's one kind of flesh of humans. There's another flesh of animals. There's another of fish, another of birds. Okay, so we all acknowledge that. We all look at that. Okay, they all have different bodies. Now he goes on. There are also celestial bodies, meaning stars, sun, moon, stars. And terrestrial bodies, meaning earthly bodies. And so we, there's all sorts of different earthly bodies, but there's also so, all sorts of different heavenly bodies than earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. So the, the brightness, you know, you look at, you know, we don't shine, but then you look at the stars or the sun, you know, and they shine. There's a glory. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. So even those heavenly bodies that shine, they have different levels of glory. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of death of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So we, he says, you sow a seed, it comes out differently. So here's the difference that is going to be. So we have corruption. This is what I was talking about earlier. That we have sin. Well, our bodies. They they decay. They rot. They 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 become you know wrinkled and you know. Our eyesight goes out. Our hearing isn't what it used to be. Our strength isn't what it used to be. And as we age, we have different health issues. Or even as we're young, we have health issues. And he says all of that, sin, the, the spiritual corruption, and the physical corruption, gone, raised in incorruption. 
no sin, no disease, no sorrow, no more tears, no more death. It is raised in glory. It, it is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. So we die and, you know, like we're not a very good representation of us. You know, when you have the you know, open casket or whatever, we're not a very good representation of ourselves. you know. And that's why we put the pictures of us from when we're younger, right? Not a very good representation of ourselves. But we're raised in glory. We're sown in dishonor. We're sown as sinners, who have then been forgiven by God and then were raised in glory without sin. Perfect. We're sown in weakness. It is raised in power. <laughs> One of the greatest symbols of our human weakness and frailty is death. You know, no, no movement, no, no heartbeat, no nothing. And then we're raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. So it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same. It, it, the, the body that we have, it's physical. And, you know, when Jesus rose again from the dead, they could touch him. He had a physicalness to him, and he ate stuff. But then he would appear in the room without using the door or the windows or anything. Like, he would just be there. And, you know, physicists, they say that that had to have required like 18 different dimensions that he existed in and it may have been infinite as he's the creator of the world and so there was a physicality to him but he also transcended that physicality and so we're not talking about like we're going to have the same kind of bodies that we have now we're going to have the type of bodies that you know, Jesus, it's a spiritual body. As the Bible says that God is spirit, and those who worship him must be worshiping him in spirit and in truth. That Jesus isn't even in heaven with this like, physical body. And I know that there's some who teach that, but that's not what you see. The different Jesus is different when he existed on this earth, <coughs> when he rose again from the dead, and then when you see him in Revelation. And in all his glory, he's different than he was here. And so I don't think that Paul is making the point necessarily like, oh, look at Jesus and the same exact type of body that he had when he walked the earth after he rose from the dead for those 40 days is exactly what's going to happen. It's going to be different than that. It's going to be a spiritual body. It's going to be an incorruptible body. It's going to be a body without weakness, a body in glory and power. And so the Apostle John, he says, you know, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to just think about the astounding nature of that statement, that we're going to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus, the God of all heaven and earth, who rose again from the dead after dying for our sins. He's our Savior. He's our King. He's our friend. He's all of those things. He's everything. We're going to stand in everything that He is. We shall see him as he is, which means, again, from a physics standpoint, that whatever dimensionality that he enjoys, we're going to enjoy the same thing. Because we can, for us to see him as he is, we have to be like him. We have to be as him. That doesn't mean that we become gods. That means that we shall be like him. What an amazing thing. What an incredible, incredible, amazing thing. And the last question that he asks is this. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. It's an Old Testament quote. And he's saying, oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that final victory, that final question, is when it shout of victory. Death 
Where is your sting? What can you threaten us? If you think about what's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you is that somebody ends your life. And from a naturalistic standpoint, that's all there is. That's the end of the story. You're done. It doesn't matter if you're 12 or you're 82. You're done. But we believe that there is something that transcends all of that. Death, where is your sting? As a Christian, you don't have to fear death. Death isn't an unknown quantity. Death is a certainty, but death is not the end. If you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, the Apostle Paul says, you have no reason to believe that you will not be risen. Also, in fact, he says this. He says that you are risen now. You, Jesus said, those who believe in me have eternal life. He said that those who believe in me, though they die, they shall never die. The Apostle Paul said to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. He even said, for me, to die, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To die is gain. For these light and momentary troubles shall not be compared with the glory that awaits us. So how is God calling you to grow today, grow in your marriage, your relationships, and your faith, and sharing your faith, and doctrine, courage, sacrifice, fear, overcoming fear? I'd love to know if God's moving in your life. If you've come to faith in Jesus Christ as a result of this, let me know. I'd love to help you out. Put in the comments how God is working in your life. I would love to get to know you, chat with you. I'll be checking back with to see what you guys all have to say. Start a great conversation amongst yourselves in the comments down below. Share this with other people in your life who want to study the Bible and give them the resources they need to do that. And by all means, check the description down below for this week's assignments. Join up with us in that. And I would love to hear your insights that you get into the text as well. And so until next time, may God's grace be with you.